Welcome to Trekosophy, the podcast about the philosophy of Star Trek. Joining us today is our captain, Ben McLean, Spock's other brother from another mother. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Highly illogical. And our chief engineer, who plays 3D chess in four dimensions, Chris McGee. <laughs> Salutations. Our technical advisor, who was Zurek's favorite student, Brandon Kirby. Joanne True. Whoops, I didn't say that. And I'm Bill Allen, a.k.a. the guy in the red shirt. And today we are talking about the Vulcans. Yeah, so... Oh, sorry. No. Please, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to say, Vulcans have been in Star Trek since the very beginning. Um, Of course, the first instance of Vulcans is in the pilot episode, The Cage... Uh, except that it's not the Vulcans aren't exactly the cold logical figures we know of today in the pilot episode. They were, well, they were all they were pretty much. I'd say they were pretty much not any different from Romulans in the uh, in the pilot, you know, or at least he wasn't uh, the the Vulcan that was in the pilot. I haven't watched that in years, but um, but uh, very quickly when we actually get to the original series, we get Spock who is remarkable for not acting, you know? <laughs> um, and by, what, by not acting, I mean not reacting, not uh, having this completely uh, withdrawn, uh, serious mannerisms and, uh, and uh, being uh, somewhat, uh, you know, being very cold and calculating and rationalistic most of the time and that's what makes his character famous and it's reflective of the entire vulcan culture that runs through the rest of star trek and of course we have vulcans are always the bad guys on ds9 and i think there's some reasons for that i might get into later but uh vulcans uh there's a tuvok on uh voyager is the spock character there i mean you know he's a he a Vulcan, half Vulcan, half human, almost exactly like Spock. Um, except he's black. Because they wanted the continuing racial diversity thing for no reason. Uh, I mean, by that point, you know, once we'd had a, a black uh, captain or uh, who became, yeah, black commander who becomes a captain, none of that matters anymore, you know? <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, <coughs> we don't have to... Uh, we don't have to have token characters after uh, Cisco. Um, he's he gets us beyond the need for token characters, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but anyway, uh, how do I get off on that tangent? Anyway, um, so this has impressed generations of people, right? Uh, Vulcans have impressed people with the follies of being swayed by emotion. And at the same time, the dangers of becoming completely disconnected from humanity by going overboard with that. Because, you know, sometimes they're in the right and, you know, and sometimes they're in the wrong. Sometimes McCoy is right, you know. And so it's, uh, Vulcans are not always the good guys, but they are a lot of the time, you know. And uh, anyway, I was hoping somebody would jump in here at some point. (laughs) You're pretty much covering all the bases here. It sounds like it's just a question of uh, where where you want to start at. Should we talk about the whole emotion versus reason thing? Should we talk about that uh, trifecta that was uh, Kirk, McCoy, and Spock, and how they both they each represented a different uh, aspect of the personality? Or let's go with the reason versus emotion thing first. I'd say. Or in your case, why logic is BS, right? Oh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say logic is BS, but I would say I think Spock, well, Nimoy's character, Nimoy's lines in the original series abuse the word logic beyond all recognition. <laughs> We got to be careful, though, because, I mean, it was the 1960s, and and if you start criticizing dialogue in the 1960s, then everything on television would make you cringe. There was no good dialogue in the original series. 
Well, that's true, but it's not that it was bad writing. It's that it was bad philosophy in that uh, that logic on the original series, as far as I can tell, means agreeing with the personal views of Mr. Spock, and that's all. Logic is not an abstract set of rules governing the truth values of propositions. It is a set of personal beliefs, mostly political and ethical, which but, are agreeing with Mr. Spock and you're logical. If you don't agree with Mr. Spock, you're logical. That's all. Captain, I have to interject something. <laughs> don't call me Captain. That was, <laughs> that was, that, that's not normal on the show. That was, that was Bill's crazy idea. <laughs> that's just the intro gimmick. It's not really a thing. <laughs> okay. Mr. McLean. <laughs> yeah, and works. <laughs> Um, I think it's beside the point whether or not Spock's conclusions rationally followed from his premises. I, I think that's beside the point. I think he is emblematic of uh, a certain thought process being superior to uh, somebody being led by their emotions. Like McCoy. Exactly. I think he's more representing a certain worldview rather than explaining it clearly for us. That's how I've always viewed Spock. No, is Gene Roddenberry, you know, the next Aristotle? No, probably he's not the greatest logician of all time. Probably he wasn't fit to write that sort of dialogue, but he is trying to represent a certain viewpoint there, which I appreciated. Yeah, well, the trouble is, what I'm arguing is that logic is not a particular worldview. It's a set of rules that govern the truth values of abstract propositions, and that's all. I disagree. Okay, so what do you think logic is? I think it can be an object of worship. I think it can be a guiding principle for our ethics. Not only can it guide our beliefs, as you say, well, as I put words in your mouth, but uh, as, as I interpret you to be saying, it, it's guiding our thoughts. It can also guide our, our actions, and it can also guide our worship. Um, in what sense can an action be illogical? If you look at the Vulcan ethic, and let's divorce ourselves from the utilitarianism, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of them, we'll say a rational action is more ethical than an irrational action. For example, if you're to put a, a cupcake in front of me, in my bodily desires, my appetites, or maybe even my emotions tell me one thing to approach the cupcake, but my reason says, look at Kirby, you're trying to lose weight. Uh, you're you're training for a sparring competition. Don't go near the cupcake. The greater good is in following the logical course of action. If I follow my appetite, there will be a moment of pleasure, but a month of despair. The greater good is in following the logical course of action, or, or the action that logic dictates to me. Well. It seems to me you're you're going with logic meaning the same thing as reflection, uh, or or thinking twice. Um, well, I don't know if that's true, but continue. Sorry, sorry, I, I ended up. Well, going. okay, I, I'm. If that's not true, then what is? What are you saying that it is then? Uh, I mean, I don't want to continue on a false premise. Or build a straw man. So, it, I just view logic as the process of clear thinking rather than unclear thinking. Okay, and what do you mean by clear? Um, so, did you say what do I mean by clear? Yes, what specifically do you mean by clear thinking? What does clear mean? Not what does thinking mean? I mean, that's I guess we can take that for granted. But what does think? What does clear mean? You mean not guided by emotions? Well, emotions, sure, uh, but it it would subscribe to a certain canon. 
I mean, for example, you have the philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, set against the sophists. And they're trying to determine what constitutes a good argument, right? Well, the philosophers are going to say a good argument is that which conforms to the dictates of logic. Whereas the sophists are going to say a good argument is that which persuades the most number of people. Yeah. Or the greatest number of people. And so there's not a clear definition as to what that might be. Whereas with logic, there's, there's a, a structure. Okay. Now, here's why I think logic is a set of rules governing the values of propositions. Uh, wow. Because what the philosophers, at least on Earth, I'm not talking about on Vulcan here, but on Earth, meaning mostly Aristotle, uh, would say is logical or is not. They would say that a statement or set of statements is logical if it conforms to the fundamental laws of thought, and it is illogical if it doesn't. Right. And the fundamental laws of thought being non-contradiction, identity, and uh, excluded middle. You can look right. those up on Wikipedia. Anybody listening who's not a doesn't have the background in philosophy to know all that, you can look up fundamental laws of thought on Wikipedia. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, anybody who's read Ayn Rand will probably know that her whole book. I'm not a Randite, but it's just worth noting that her whole book, Atlas Shrugged, is divided into sections based on each of the three laws, which is just kind of a neat gimmick. Um, even though I don't agree with her philosophy, that's a neat gimmick. Um, that is what is really meant by Aristotle, at least, and I think by the others, by Socrates and Plato, though they haven't codified it yet, uh, but I, I think that is still, they would agree, that is what is meant by logical. Um, well, and I, I agree with that, too. I'm just saying that those that process of clear thinking, that which corresponds to some logical laws, the ones you mentioned, I think, are a good starting point. Uh, that can also govern our actions. And in that, it can become uh, something more encompassing than just this is true, this is untrue. Well, it can wait, also... how, how do the fundamental laws of thought govern our actions? Because this is what John Galt says in Atlas Shrugged. He says uh, that the fundamental laws of thought can govern our actions. And I, I don't see it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see how there are any imperatives in the fundamental laws of thought. Wow, that is an excellent question. You're uh, you're not talking about moving from an is to an ought. You're you're talking about well, uh, that 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 would be one way of looking at it. I mean, if you if you accept if you go as far as David Hume and accept David Hume's is ought distinction, then the uh, fundamental laws of thought are all ises and not oughts. Uh, you could say they govern oughts because oughts are propositions about ethics, but uh, they are not oughts in themselves. Right. Well, you could look at it from the perspective of, of something Aquinian, though. Okay. Where I, I'm not I, a huge big on Thomas Aquinas, so I'm very interested to hear this. Okay. Well, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> hope I'm not. I hope we're not totally leaving all the rest of you guys in the dust here. Oh, that, that's yeah. why we're here. That's why we're here. No, no, no. Yeah. Carry on. Carry on. Okay. Okay. You begin with these speculative innate principles, and you apply them with reason to a particular situation, and this is the foundation of what he calls the natural law. But this can be disrupted by emotion or passion. I mean, for example, um, I, I I have a notion that I ought to respect property because I'm part of a society. And so I see something that doesn't belong to me, so I reason that I shouldn't take it. I apply the, my innate speculative principle to a particular situation. I say, okay, well, I shouldn't take that. That's natural law. Or you yes, could look I'm a, at... I'm a natural law theorist, yes. Curso. Oh, perfect. Okay, perfect. I'm more from, more from John Locke than from Aquinas, but yeah. All right. So if you look at it... I mean, you can use any controversial issue and argue both sides of the coin. Both sides of the coin. Uh, if you look at abortion, you could say uh, 
we have an innate speculative principle, whether this is true or not, it's beside me, where we should respect equality or women's rights. And you apply that um, to the abortion issue and you say, okay, well, let's respect women's rights. And a pro-life advocate could say, you have such a passion for women's rights, which is a good thing. I mean, God gives us our passions. Uh, but it's disrupted the reasoning process. And therefore, you've come to an immoral conclusion. Or you could say, conversely, somebody has such a passion for life that it's disrupted the reasoning process. And therefore, you've come to an immoral conclusion. The bad thing is when the passion or the emotion disrupts the reasoning process. Okay, so That's you're saying – so you're saying, in summary then, uh, tell me if this is – I want to restate what you just said, and then you tell me whether what I am saying is, is matching what you're saying. Okay, That's how you make sure you've comprehended something in philosophy, right? Oh, I mean, oh yeah. Re restate it. Okay, That's so my understanding is you just said that an action is illogical when it is, it is the result of thinking processes that allowed the passions – to uh, supersede or contradict or override the reasoning part of the mind, or the the uh, the the, the uh, yeah the reason, basically the passions override the reason. Right. That's what makes an action illogical. Right. Okay. That seems like more of a figure of speech than a strict. I mean that 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 sounds more like you're justifying this as a as a figure of speech than as a strictly technically accurate philosophical uh, uh, position that actions can be illogical, you know, because what you're really saying is that particular thought processes are 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 illogical because they uh, they uh, their conclusions don't follow from their premises, and that basically what you're saying is that. An irrational action is any one that is really caused by an irrational thought process, or an illogical, sorry, illogical action by an illog is one that's caused by an illogical thought process. Well, in that case, I would, you know, I would argue back that it's really the thought process that is illogical, not the action. Uh, oh but, well, I, I agree with that. I mean, look at the look at the ancients. They're going to divide logic up into two categories, the speculative and the, uh, the practical. And the, the speculative is theoretical logic if you want to argue about metaphysics or whatever. But the practical is ethics. Oh, right. So that's sort of early is ought then, isn't it? Sure. Uh, but when we're talking about practical reasoning and you have an ethics – that's based on your emotions and that leads you to take immoral actions, your illogical thoughts have guided you to illogical actions. And those are immoral actions according to the Vulcan philosophy. Okay. Well, um, all right. So if that is the Vulcan philosophy behind the scenes, that's fine and all, but that's still not covering all the uses of logic that Mr. Spock does. He quite often says this is illogical, and all it really means is he's disagreeing with him. But I think they work on that in some of the later shows. I think Tuvok doesn't abuse logical quite as much. Um, and there are a number of instances of uses of the word logical where he is actually um, – he, you know, it, there are some legitimate uses of the word logic, at least in the sense that you're saying here. But still, a lot of the time, it's Mr. Spock's opinion. I mean, it really is. I'd have to, we'd have to get into scripts and specific episodes to, for me to justify that, and I, that's a little too much to do on a podcast. But on the one hand, he's gotten a lot of people to go down the road we've just gone down, and that's good. But on the other hand, He's also gotten a lot of people to uh, to abuse the word the way he does. For example, I've heard countless people uh, assert that materialism basically is synonymous with logic, and it's just 
No, that is not what logic means. Um, so, you know, it's just materialism and also various political ideas, you know, as synonymous with logic. And I guess I have a tendency to blame Mr. Spock for that. Also, people have a tendency to uh, describe emotions as always bad. And I, I, no, they're not. It's just you have to be in control of them instead of them being in control of you. And that's one good thing. So it's a mixed bag. A lot of stuff on Star Trek and in life is a mixed bag. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In a, in a lot of ways, as they develop the culture of Vulcans, um, and a lot of that development really has to kind of be ignored because it was sort of uh, nine times out of ten, they'd use it as a deus ex machina. Oh, yeah, Vulcans have uh, spare eyelids that they never use except when they need <laughs> to use them. They have um, green blood. They They have... Yeah, they have an extra antibody in their blood that we never mention until this one time when they need it. You know, they just he's alien so we can add stuff to him. But they did try to start developing their culture a little bit and explain why they were all into emotion suppressing, which is the big side of the Vulcan style of logic, whatever Surax philosophy is, you want to call it, whether it's a study of logic or whether it's just a set of rules regarding the governing of emotions that if followed it's what Vulcans consider the logical rules to follow to suppress emotions but that uh that that emotionality of uh of the Vulcans and and how it changed over time is um is the interesting aspect of it to me anyway right yeah I mean, I'm not. I mean, you guys, you guys have have it nailed down basically as to to what what logic actually is, as far as what it is to be logical. But um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make in my long, mindless rambling is, if we look at our rules of logic, is is the Vulcan philosophy logical, or is it something like the uh, one of those old classical paradoxes where? If you follow the rules within the paradox, it works out a certain way that makes absolutely no sense and defies common sense to anybody else. Is it only logical within the frame of reference of Vulcans, or does it have a uh, a wider scope? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I'm I'm I was looking something up, and I think I lost you for a second. I um, think I lost myself too. Yeah, um, my eyes are starting to glaze over. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's been one of those days. <laughs> I don't think it's your fault. I mean, I was, I was looking no, up something I'm going to bring up a little later, so. All right. Um, ben and Brandon have pretty thoroughly gone over what logic is from the classical Aristotelian model on through to <laughs> modern interpretations of it. Aristotelian what? <laughs> what Aristotle said. Oh, okay. Oh, the Aristotelian model. Okay. Oh, it's pronounced... Dude's name is Aristotle, so wouldn't it be the Aristotelian model? Well, no, Eng English is not friendly. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's Aristotelian model. Aristotelian model. Let's change the pronunciation of his name. It's like tomato okay. and tomato. <laughs> yeah, but, but nobody actually says tomato. That one, I'm my sorry. Point. And nobody actually <laughs> says ar 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 Aristotelian, or whatever you said. <laughs> Aristot well, they say Aristotle. Aristotelian. Oh, right. Nobody actually says Aristotelian. It's Aristotelian. Sorry. <laughs> Aristotelian. Well, Aristotel had these roots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I sorry. didn't make up the language. I just speak it. <laughs> yeah, we all speak it, but do we speak it all that well? Anyway, let's let, don't get me started on tomato tomato we thing. That's a whole it. other subject. We ain't speaking it too well. <laughs> Um, my point is, you guys have laid out what the basic rules of what logic is, and I, I guess my question is, from what I understand from following what you guys are saying, these rules can then be used to examine any kind of uh, system of morals and ethics. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Now, Brandon and I were able to quickly come to a consensus on what the system of ethics is because we're both natural law theorists okay. uh but other people uh but believing in natural law theory involves accepting a number of 
first principles or, or basic premises or basic beliefs, which you need in order to use logic, in order to be able to uh, actually exercise or, or operate, you know, you need logic by itself makes no claims and no uh, no imperatives you need something else you need a set of of first principles or assumptions uh which you can then reason with or reason upon or reason about you know um logic by itself doesn't you know it's sort of like justice is blind well logic by itself is uh deontological it, it has no uh no content I don't know if I'm using deontological correctly, but it has no content until you start, until you have some starting assumptions. It's like a computer program. No inputs, no outputs, you know? Of course, it's really the other way around, computer program based on logic, but you get my point. If there's no inputs, there's no outputs. You have to have some input in order to be able to do logic, and that's one of the reasons I had this big objection to the idea of courses of action being regarded as logical rather than thoughts, because... A course of action doesn't have, um, you know, doesn't have anything you can evaluate. It's a, it's a thing that happened, and there's nothing about a thing that happens that can contradict other things that happen. You know, I mean, it either happened or it didn't, and that's all. You know, you have to have some imperatives, something like natural law theory, in order to, you know, so you really need some kind of background, some kind of information, some, some assumptions and inputs and so on. Uh, you need to have some ethical uh, first principles in order to be able to say a course of action is illogical in the moral sense Vulcans use. And they uh, they do have that. The, the Vulcans, they, they have a, a set of uh, principles, uh, a set of uh, first principles that they apply that to, don't they? Are, are those um, something we should maybe talk about now, or is it too soon? Am I getting ahead of myself? No, that's okay. Um the Vulcans have they, – they, they never get all that specific on what Vulcan ethics are. We can talk about Spock's ethics, and we can talk about Eidic, and that's, and that's just about all. Um, but uh, Spock's ethics are somewhat utilitarian in uh, The Wrath of Khan. Uh, he says that famous line, the needs of the many – of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And that is of course the maxim of utilitarianism. And when I saw that, I was like, no, because <laughs> I'm not a utilitarian. Uh, but I was really glad when they spent the whole next two movies undoing that and uh, saying, no, actually sometimes the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. Uh, so uh, utilitarianism does not have the final word in the Star Trek universe. And I was like, oh, well, that's a big relief there. <laughs> um, but uh, so so Spock's got some kind of utilitarianism going on. And I can understand why, from a writing perspective, they'd give him that kind of a system, even if they don't really believe it, because apparently they don't because of the other movies, because it's the it has a reputation of being the most strictly cold calculating rationalistic sort of ethical system that they could probably give them don't you think yeah and i think not just as a writing shortcut but also to uh, sort of fit the character it works for spock to it makes sense for spock to be that uh that strictly utilitarian yeah, I mean, if I was writing him and I didn't have to come up with an excuse for him to save the ship, then I'd probably make him a Kantian, but whatever. Well, I mean, the thing is, you also you, you have to look at his background because, I mean, Vulcans are really, really racist bigots. They are? Well, oh, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. They In are. so many ways. They, um, yeah, they well, are. I mean, compared to humans, and humans are the predominant member of the Federation, Vulcans live longer, they're stronger. They're smarter. And they they're are better at in, baseball. They're even better at baseball, but they don't have as much fun as we do. But that's not. But yeah, I mean, in so many ways, the Vulcans are more advanced than we are. They've had warp drive longer. They, um, and from the little bits and pieces you gather from this, that, and the other through the course of the many series and movies, you find out that Vulcans they have emotions and that their emotions are even stronger than human emotions to the point where Vulcan civilization 
nearly eradicated itself way worse than even humanity at its most violent, which is part of why Surak came along and did the whole we got to control our emotions bit way back in the dawn of Vulcan history. Yeah. I'm not so, sure that makes them bigots, though, or racist. Well, the way they act does. They're, like, they're <laughs> not motivated by hate, but they tend to dismiss... Um, they have a smug superiority. They do have this. They have a superiority complex. Haven't you ever Can seen Enterprise? Yes, and... I've seen Enterprise, and I'll tell you why I don't agree with that. It's because they have a canon of what constitutes good behavior, and they, therefore, they have a canon of what constitutes bad behavior. I mean, that's a natural consequence of that. And when they say, "Okay, we're going to affirm logic," And we're going to repudiate or reject illogical actions. And then they'll see other species, other races, humans, the Fringi, and so forth, who are acting illogically. They don't like that. It's not because they don't like humans innately because we are human. It is because they don't like illogical actions. And that's why they reject uh, us as being their equals. It, I can... it... Go ahead. I... I can understand that and I can follow that, but um, I, I think the reason why I want to say they're bigots is it's it's one thing to repudiate the actions of the other uh, of of another person, but it's it's the way they go about doing it because of their outlook on life. It's more efficient just to tell somebody you're stupider than me. You couldn't think as fast as me if you wanted to. They lack a certain uh, social civility. They they can't find the nice way to say they're better than us. Especially that guy from the from the DS9 from the baseball episode. That right. Guy. And in Spock's case, particularly, what with him being half human, he um, has something of an inf- inferiority complex among his own people. So I think he might overcompensate, which is why he is that utilitarian extreme that uh, Ben was mentioning. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't call Spock a utilitarian extreme, but he does he does parrot the maxim of utilitarianism as justification for his self sacrifice in the movie, and that's all fine and good as far as it goes. But it has wider philosophical implications of utilitarianism in general that I don't like. Well, it's not just that I don't like; I don't think I think are not true. As I said, I'm a natural law theorist, not a utilitarian. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he's right as far as he goes, but the, uh, the maxim doesn't hold all the time, you know, in every situation. And, and I'll tell you, one of the biggest ones that always comes to my mind is in Galileo seven, when at the end of the show, he basically said he used logic to determine it was time to stop using logic. Right. What? I don't remember that. What, what was the situation then? That was the most brilliant part of all of Star Trek. Really? Oh, absolutely. I thought the circle was. <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah, the the opening scene of the circle where with the with the with the uh, Odo's big speech. I thought that was my that's my favorite part. Anyway, <laughs> I, I I'm gonna have to give it to Galileo Seven. That I mean, sometimes okay. the dialogue did fall flat, but the original series had some great concepts. It so was... tell me what happened in Galileo Seven. I don't remember go, it. Go ahead, Kirby, because I I don't remember the exact speech. Oh, I don't remember the speech either. I just remember the exact same thing you did. That's... Well, basically, what happened was is uh, uh, they were got the uh, shuttlecraft off the planet. Finally, it took almost everything they had in order to get it off the planet. They were stranded. Uh, Nimoy, or excuse me, Spock was in in command of this you know group of seven people. Many of them had died under his command on the planet, even though he made what, we, what he considered the most logical choices every step of the way. But, you know, that's the backstory. They, he finally got off the planet, orbiting the planet. They only had enough fuel to orbit it, like, maybe once. And then they were going to drop right back down and burn up. Well, as this was happening, the Enterprise was a little bit out of range. They could not see uh, this little shuttlecraft orbiting the planet to go rescue them. Right. So 
Spock says, where "Well, is, where, where we the radar either... is damaged, where the scanner is damaged." Yeah, it could be. I didn't. I I do not remember. Um, Probably Spock basically. They can find that in other episodes. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's the writers for you. But Spock, Spock finally said, "Well, we, you know, he fought in his mind. Well, we can either just kind of orbit here for another what was it, fifteen, twenty minutes, or we can go ahead." And he 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 rationalized his in his mind to what was it? Dump the fuel and ignite it so that it would leave like a fire trail behind him. It would lose up all their exactly. fuel, and then they would immediately start to you know go, go down into into the planet and burn up. But he figured maybe, just maybe, the Enterprise was close enough to see that flare and pick them up before they uh, burned up. Sure enough, it worked. Deus, you know, kind of. I don't know if that's considered Deus Ex Machina or not, but uh, and he he justified himself uh, to Kirk by saying, "Well, you know, it wasn't a logical thing to do because I was, I was sacrificing." all of the crew members' lives by attempting this last-ditch effort. Um, but logic dictated it was time to uh, not be logical and, 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 you know, go for the last-ditch effort, more or less. I mean, yeah. obviously, he didn't use those words, but that's basically what he was saying. Okay. Um, it sounds like maybe he's saying that logic in the classical... Aristotelian sense of uh, conforming to the fundamental laws of thought dictated that he had to abandon the Vulcan, uh, the logic in the sense of the Vulcan code of ethics. Maybe that's what he's saying. So one sense of logic dictated abandoning another sense of logic. That would at least make you know some kind of coherent sense. I interpret it. Like Pascal's wager, where yes. you you use your cognitive faculties and you use them to the best of your ability, which involves logic, and you arrive at a point whereby you say, okay, this just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to have to take a leap. It's, I mean, the, the common analogy is a relationship. Uh, when I'm met the woman who would become my wife, I could accumulate as much evidence as I could. I could propose logical arguments for the conclusion that she would be fun to live with for the next 20 years. Um, but I can't do that. I, w I was in a particular situation where I really can't use the logical process anymore. And so the only thing that makes sense according to logic is to do something that's to take a leap. Okay, well, I've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. And so you take a leap where there's no foundation, there, there's no real uh, rhyme or reason to it uh, because you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Logic dictates the end of itself. Uh, well, I, relationships are not based on syllogisms. That's certainly I, true. I know, but logic could lead you to a relationship. Logic could lead you to a place where logic is no more. Well, hold on, though. Relationships are not based on syllogisms, but taking a leap of faith or, or doing something that isn't uh, that doesn't have a, a specific justification is not necessarily an abandonment or a suspension of logic. It's just to decision. I mean, to do something. Um, right. Maybe it's a suspension of the uh, logic in the sense of a Vulcan-type code of ethics, but there's nothing in the fundamental laws of thought about never taking a leap of faith on something. Well, that's true. I bet the logic doesn't have any jurisdiction in this circumstance, so logic pushes you to a point where logic is not. Well, yeah, it doesn't have jurisdiction because, like I said... At least from my point of view, logic is strictly a set of rules governing the truth values of abstract propositions. And since we're not dealing with a proposition, we're dealing with a course of action, uh, you know, and we haven't got, um, you know, we haven't got um, anything to reason with, then we're not, um, we're not reasoning in order to get there. But on the other hand, 
just because we're not reasoning doesn't mean we are, uh, uh, what's the word, acting in, in a way that's contrary to logic. And Mr. Spock will often say that a lot of things are contrary to logic when what they really are is contrary to some particular proposition that he believes and the other person doesn't believe. And uh, so, you know, in that sense, he's uh, often begging the question when he says this is illogical or that is illogical. Uh, quite often he's begging the question. And uh, that's what really irks me about Mr. Spock's it's illogical thing. <laughs> well, not just that. If uh, If we can carry on to the sort of emotion versus logic thing... I've got a I've got a quote that I think is somewhat relevant that I'd like to bring up in regard to Vulcans and their point of view that uh the passions are always uh, hindrances to reason that's sort of the Vulcan view isn't it that the passions are just about always hindrances or interferences with reason uh or, or even contra contrary to reason and contemptible um well, there's a there's an interesting quote on that, and I think it's pretty. I think it's a pretty cool thing that we were both talking about Augustine and Aquinas earlier, and about natural law, because uh, this is a quote from uh, the Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis's defense of natural law theory from 1943, and uh, he says, um, "I hope I get the context of this quote right. Uh, I've got the book." The ebook here. Um, he says, uh, basically, he's trying to argue against the modern educators and their tendency to sort of do what you know the, the Vulcans are all about. Regard, uh, try to get us to regard everything with this uh, uh, completely objective, detached uh, view, and not have. Uh, emotions evolved in it at all and uh, regard all emotional or, or judgments of value as illogical, which is what some people tend to do with logic. And he says, uh, let, let us, uh, he says, uh, no justification of virtue, meaning logical justification of virtue, will enable a man to be virtuous. Without the aid of trained emotions, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. I had sooner play cards against a man who was quite skeptical about ethics, but bred to believe that a gentleman does not cheat, than against an irreproachable moral philosopher who had been brought up among sharpers. In battle, it is not syllogisms that will keep the reluctant nerves and muscles to their post in the third hour of the bombardment. The crudest sentimentalism, such as the modern educators would wince at, about a flag or a country or a regiment will be of more use. We were told it all long ago by Plato. As the king governs by his executive, so reason must rule the mere appetites by means of the spirited element. The head rules the belly through the chest, the seat, as Alamus tells us, of magnanimity of emotions organized by trained habit into stable sentiments. The chest magnanimity, magnanimity sentiment, these are the indispensable liaison officers between cerebral man and visceral man. It may even be said that it is by this middle element that man is man, for by his intellect he is mere spirit, and by his appetite, mere animal. Now, what... Lewis has just uh, done here is argued that you really can't have a reason that is completely uh, divorced from emotion that actually gets you the kind of behavior Vulcans, I think, are looking for. And he also does this interesting thing that divides the mind of man into three parts, which we get in Plato and we get again in Freud, uh, where there's three parts to the mind. And uh, this gets into the sort of general theory of the original series and its philosophy uh, which is that the Enterprise is a giant brain, or a giant mind, a representation of the human mind. And the three major characters are representative in just about all 
of the original series and the movies in large measure are they are representative of the three parts to the mind the head the chest and the stomach meaning the intelligence or intellect the will and the appetites or desire or passions and of course spock is the head the intellect kirk is the chest or the will and mccoy is the stomach or the passions and so uh of course uh, lewis is saying that neither of these other two work without the chest without the will the uh which is where our uh which is what balances the two. So does everybody get what I'm saying here, or am I going completely off? Because you guys have been really quiet. <laughs> I follow no, you that, entirely. That, that makes digesting sense. It. <laughs> yeah. The Abolition of Man, my favorite philosophy book. I recommend it. If you only read one book on philosophy in your life, The Abolition of Man is the one I recommend. Uh, because, uh, it, yeah, Defense of Natural Law Theory. Brilliant stuff. I have a whole video series about it on YouTube. <laughs> Can I add something of my own writing? Oh, right. Yes, definitely. I'm actually I'm working on a book right now, which uh, provided my motivation for wanting to be here on the interplay of Star Trek and religion. Oh, yeah. Um, and one of the things that I've really been uh, fond of was Kierkegaard saying there's so much in modern culture – where we intellectualize that which should be passionate and we're passionate or emotional about that which we should be intellectual about. With politics, we tend to form our views based on some sort of a joke rather than an intellectual rigorous investigation. But where we should be passionate, like a banquet, we instead follow all these rules. So you don't wear your hat at the table. Use this fork rather than that fork. And he says, we've got it all wrong. It should be the other way around. Um, so following that thought, I was comparing the two cultures, the Klingon culture, which is passionate and tries to cultivate the passions through stories and through honor and so forth, and the Vulcan culture, which admires truth and tries to cultivate that with logic. And against that, I wrote this. And... I want to know what you guys think of this. We should prefer logic in questions of truth because truth isn't necessarily what we desire it to be. In matters of passion, Pascal writes, the heart has its reasons that reason doesn't understand. The criticism of Vulcans is that they only have sex once every seven years, which was said tonight. The criticism of the Klingons is that they only have a critical thought once every seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can appreciate either way of life. The only thing I could never appreciate would be a culture that asks us to think with our heart and feel with our mind. This would be the inversion of everything beautiful and true. Going to a banquet only to find systematic and rigorous rules about whether or not it's moral to wear a hat at the table or which fork to strikes me as the opposite of everything a banquet should be. A passionate, joyful celebration. Vulcans never touch their food. But Klingons never touch their utensils. Conversely, to believe in something because of sensationalism, rhetoric, or a desire for a thing to be so, or perhaps a comedian told a joke about what to believe, um, who to believe in things contrary to him, these are the opposites of logic, our path to truth. Our culture, a, a culture that promotes sensationalism in religion or politics but systematic rules at banquets has it backwards. We should be systematic when we think about religion and politics, but sensational at banquets. Otherwise, we Vulcanize that which is Klingon, and we Klingonize that which is Vulcan. That's my humble contribution. Hmm. Feel like free that. to criticize. Yeah. Feel free to criticize, by all means. No, that's actually, uh, that's actually pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. I would uh, suggest, though, that uh, both the Vulcans and the Klingons go overboard. Uh, and I, I really think uh, I would try to bring up the idea of the uh, the uh, you said uh, the the whole idea of the straight and narrow path. Uh, the idea that you don't go off to the left or off to the right. Uh, you try to avoid the extremes. 
or uh, Aristotle's golden. Yeah, that meat. was Aristotle. Yeah. I mean, it's in a lot of different forms. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different forms. I mean, Jesus said it, Buddha said it, Aristotle said it, lots of people said it. Uh, I, I totally agree. And and that's so we need to not be not be Klingons, not be Vulcans, <laughs> either one. Th- both of those are. They're almost like polar opposites. Yeah. Yeah, they're sort of exaggerated caricatures that have been artificially uh, abstracted from. Um, the human uh, psyche. And that's one of the things I've said before. There are no alien values on Star Trek. Every value on Star Trek exists in real world history somewhere, real world history or culture, or is a reshuffling of values from real world history and culture. No one can really invent a new value. I don't think I, I don't think we should try maybe to be some kind of half Vulcan, half Klingon hybrid. I think, I mean, I'm kind of leaning towards uh, what Brandon was saying here. If I was following it, right. When it's time to be a Klingon, be a Klingon. And when it's time to be a Vulcan, be a Vulcan. Because there are times when you need just that critical thinking, follow the rules mentality. And there are times when you need to grab life by the horns and enjoy the ride. The trick is knowing when to use which. Yeah, that's the tricky part, is knowing when to be Klingon and when to be... But I don't think we should try to be both at the same time and i don't think we should try to be some kind of half vulcan half klingon making our way through life yeah well i think we have to be careful not to go overboard in either direction i disagree yeah well you're a kierkegaardian and i'm not so (laughs) there was that quote You guys are all smarter than me and you know your guys better than this um but there was a quote from gandhi that always gets mangled to try to prove that even Gandhi um, endorsed violence. But he had something along the lines of, if there is peace in your heart, be peaceful. If there is violence in your heart, be violent. But in all things, you have to be true to your nature and not try to deny what you are or hold back on it. Something like that. Am I right? I Well, I agree with the sentiment. Uh, Captain Benjamin, surely... Um, <laughs> I'm gonna. You're gonna Admiral be arrested. Benjamin. I'm gonna show up on Star Trek sometime, and, and I'm gonna get arrested for impersonating a captain. You guys <laughs> okay, Admiral Benjamin. <laughs> no. Surely you'd agree with uh, G.K. Chesterton. Um, he once wrote the pagan philosophy. Now he's hitting Aristotle on this. The pagan philosophy is to mix your colors and to be moderate, to mix red and white, and Aristotle admires pink. But what Christianity does is is it admires uh, red and white side by side, and it's full colors. We're, We're to be extreme in some senses and extreme in other senses, which are seemingly paradoxical. Let me bring up a quote here. Um, but he, he, this is drawn out with Christ at several uh, points as well. I mean, Christ is extremely merciful, but he's extremely uh, passionate, uh, ferocious. Yeah, but he's uh, always times. he's always but he's always under control. I don't think Jesus is ever out of control. There uh, were a when couple of spots. I'm saying I don't I. I read the New Testament. I think I'm pretty familiar with the whole story of throwing the money changers out of the temple. And I think Jesus did that completely under control in the sense that it was all in exact proportion to what needed to be done and what was deserved. Here's the quote from Nietzsche, and I want to know uh, what you think of this, Captain Admiral, whatever you are. Joan of Arc. Just was Ben, not, thanks. This is, this is, what was that? Just Ben, thanks. <laughs> Just Ben? Okay. Uh, this is from Chesterton Orthodoxy. Yes. Joan of Arc was not stuck at the crossroads, either by rejecting all paths like Tolstoy or by accepting them all like Nietzsche. She chose a path and went down it like a thunderbolt. Yet Joan, when I came to think of her, had all in her that was true either in Tolstoy or Nietzsche all that was even tolerable in either of them. 
I thought of all that is noble in Tolstoy, the pleasure in plain things, especially in plain pity, the actualities of the earth, the reverence for the poor, the dignity of the bowed back. Joan of Arc had all that, and with this great addition, that she endured poverty as well as admiring it, whereas Tolstoy is only a typical aristocrat trying to find out its secret. And then I thought of all that was brave and proud and pathetic and poor Nietzsche and his mutiny against the emptiness and timidity of our time. I thought of his cry for the ecstatic equilibrium of danger, his hunger for the rush of great horses, his cry to arms. Well, Joan of Arc had that, and with this difference. She did not praise fighting, but fought. We know that she was not afraid of an army, while Nietzsche, for all we know, was afraid of a cow. Tolstoy only praised the peasant. She was the peasant. Nietzsche praised the warrior. She was the warrior. She beat them both at their own antagonistic ideals. She was more gentle than one and more violent than the other. She was a perfectly practical person who did something, while they are wild speculators who do nothing. So whereas I see Christianity, I see it as uh, bringing together, yes, this war cry, go off to arms, but at the same time, we're to be lambs. It, it's this paradox, side by side, uh, two things that really don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Hmm. I, uh, um, on the one hand, I'm not Catholic, and so and uh, so I have I haven't got Chesterton's same reasons to be particularly enamored with uh, with uh, Joan of Arc, uh, but I think uh, you know, abstracting from it being Joan of Arc who. I my my feelings are awfully ambiguous about uh, abstracting from it being Joan of Arc. Uh, she does. It starts with the uh, with the uh, narrow path. Uh, don't go either way, off either way, uh, principle, and then uh, it goes to the place where um, Dan, uh, Davy Crockett said. Uh, Sorry, my my American is showing. Uh, Davy <laughs> Davy Crockett said, "Be sure you're right, and then go ahead." And I I can certainly agree with that. But the process of making sure you're right that that would have to be within the whole straight and narrow path idea. Right. Yeah. yeah. Be Vulcan when you're being sure you're right, but then again, be Klingon when you're actually going out and doing it. Sure. So we agree. I guess. I hadn't really gone through distinguishing, um, but I think I think I, I don't have anything I can pull up. But I I think I've said things in the past along the lines of uh, our needing to. Uh, uh, well, that was what I that quote from Lewis uh, did say that uh, the the passions have their place and need to be involved when when they are supposed to be involved um but not in deciding what to do but in the doing of it definitely right i so i think we agree i think we're on the same page here so what we need to get is a dark evil uh um a dark evil uh postmodern Nietzsche type uh, Dawkins worshiping heathen in here to argue with. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's what we need next next time. We need to dig up somebody like that who who absolutely loves Roddenberry's uh, uh, Roddenberry's humanism and uh, Picard saying that the uh, that disbelieving in the supernatural is an achievement <laughs> then we can get a more less agreement and more uh, <laughs> more <laughs> more more great debate on here <laughs> well uh, do you want to know something crewman benjamin somebody I, oh, okay. oh now i'm <laughs> getting demoted you know, you're gonna make that stick now we're gonna actually have to start having ranks since if you're gonna keep that up <laughs> we're gonna have to actually start keeping track of who's who's got ranks and who doesn't and Start giving out awards or whatever. <laughs> I, I say this as somebody who has an unblemished record of Protestantism. Huh. I mean, 
I'm Orthodox. I, I read the early church fathers and really admire what they have to say. I actually enjoyed who watches the watchers and card speech to the Mintakins and to his crew when he's discussing the Mintakins. That was TOS. The, no, no, the original no. series. All right. Or not the original series, Next Generation. Next Generation. Okay. That's one of my Remind favorites. Remind me too. what was happening in that one, and I'll probably have seen it. Well, you just referenced it. Um, I did? It, I think so. It, Picard was... Uh, oh, that that is the one where he says that uh, disbelieving in the uh, supernatural is a... Is an accomplishment. Okay, yeah. I just didn't remember the... Uh, I just didn't remember the uh, the name of the episode. Who watches the Watchers? And the alien species were the Mintakins. Right. Um, you know, I, I could actually be sidetracking us. Maybe we should talk about, uh, if we're, we're ever to talk about the Ferengi and what it looks like to have a perverted religion, maybe I could bring this up then. I, I don't want to sidetrack because there's so many interesting things to talk about with the Balkans. Uh, yeah, we want to do Ferengi in, a, in an upcoming episode. How are we doing on time? We have just hit the one hour mark. Ah, okay. Well, how about this? How about we talk about the Ferengi next time? (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I did say we needed to bring some Nietzsche all up in here, all up in this hizzy. So uh, I love, (laughs) I love Nietzsche. I, you know what? We'll bring him up next time. Yes, and I'm the anti Nietzsche. (laughs) Um. So um. And uh. Ayn Rand is, of course, the big Ferengi. The Ferengis are a parody of Ayn Rand. And so we're going to be talking somewhat about Ayn Rand next time. If anybody else finds that stomachable to talk about her. All right. Hey, <laughs> yeah. So do we have anything else we wanted to bring up about Vulcans before we close out? I guess not. Um... Oh, one more thing. I'll probably edit this in, uh, but the metaphysics of, of Vulcans is actually worth talking about. Uh, in Star Trek, the search for Spock, there the Vulcans have a, a metaphysics that is important, um, where there's the, uh, the they have a dualistic metaphysics of the body and the soul being two separate things, the body and the what they call the katra, which is the soul. Um, and they get their metaphysics mostly right, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm somewhat of a dualist myself. Uh, not in the Cartesian, not in the strict Cartesian sense, but in a general sense. Um, you know, uh, as a Christian, I believe there's a body and the spirit. And uh, Vulcans are not strict materialists like um, like you would expect. Uh, they even identify their rationalism more with a s- sort of mysticism that happens on Vulcan, which is very surprising for people who watch The Search for Spock and know much about who Spock is. That's very unexpected. Well, is it unexpected? Because we typically associate in today's culture – Culturally, not not logically, but culturally, we associate rationalism with materialism. I wasn't around for that conversation. That it's obviously you haven't been on the internet very much. <laughs> I mean, that is could be true. Uh, I'm uh, what? That's likely true. Yeah, I mean, culturally materialists are assumed to be the completely rationalistic types and supernaturalists uh, and any other any other alternative uh, metaphysical theory to naturalism its adherents are portrayed as being uh, weird off the wall um, types what hippies yeah hippies <laughs> or hippies or fundamentalists that, yeah, hippies are fundamentalists, depending on whether they are supernaturalists or uh, pantheistic monists. Um, or anarchists, I guess. Uh, the, the nihilists are, are in there, too, uh, alt- as an alternative to, uh, uh, to materialism. So basically, yeah, if, if, you know, if you're scientific, if you're rationalistic, 
you're assumed to be a materialist. And so that is somewhat of a surprise when uh, Vulcans turn out to have this whole mystical side to them in the search for Spock that brings Spock back from the dead. Very unexpected. Well, it's hinted out in the original series a couple times, though. Yeah, I mean, it's not completely unexpected because they've had that uh, psychic mojo <laughs> almost from the beginning. Yeah, but it wasn't supernaturalistic like this, though. It, it wasn't, um, it didn't, you know, they never separated, they never fully separated the, the body and the, the Katra. Well, even in the uh, movies, technically they didn't separate it. Um, he just sort of uh, gave McCoy a copy. <laughs> uh, it never says it's a copy. Well, his think about soul, it. If he I mean, gave his soul to uh, McCoy, then he wouldn't have had his little final speech with uh, Kirk right before he passed away. Well, it's kind of uh, only tenuously connected at that point. McCoy is only a few feet away. Yeah. <laughs> But, okay, um, well, if that's what know. you want to believe, that's fine. I mean, every time I watched that movie, that was what I thought of it was. It was um, the the Vulcan tradition is, I guess it was something along the lines of, I don't know, I think about the same time that movie came out, I was rereading uh, Ender's Game and that whole Speaker for the Dead bit. But that's what it is. The part two, part three, Spock uh, has to have his soul examined his knowledge, his life experience passed on or shared with those important to him on Vulcan. I don't know, but they never really say exactly why they got to send the soul into another vessel, but it's Sarek comes in and says, that's, that's our way. Right before we die, we give our soul, you know, we give our Katra to somebody, but the way he does it with McCoy and the fact that he still can make that final connection with Kirk makes me think of it more like copying data than actually, moving the soul from one body to another. Well, yeah, they go into that in the books, why they actually do that. And they've got a sort of, uh, sort of vault of souls or whatever, uh, like deep underground temple place on Vulcan where they can actually go and like consult their ancestors. If they are high enough up, if they're leveled up high enough, (laughs) they got high enough MP or whatever. You know, like it, like it's an RPG in their uh, collinear um, discipline. The highest level of collinear monks can uh, consult these uh, sort of vessels that contain vessels in the sense of like actual like jars that contain the souls of the uh, Vulcan ancestors. And uh, so there's a sort of Volk ancestor worship that's, uh, what's the word, uh, the mystery religion part of the uh, Vulcan mysticism that's in there. <laughs> kind of reminds me of that scene from Joe versus the Volcano. Um, has anybody here seen Joe versus the Volcano? Yes, I have. One of the greatest romantic comedies of all time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just say one of the greatest <laughs> movies of all time, period, and just leave it at that. Um, Sorry, haven't seen it yet. Tom uh, Hanks and Meg Ryan. Yeah, this was Tom Hanks' first big movie. Uh, have you seen it, uh, Brandon? A nine. Okay, if you like existentialism at all, go get that movie, like, tomorrow, seriously. Um, anyway, he, he goes to the desert island, and there's the chief there, and he asks the chief, the, the chief of the natives, and he asks uh, the islanders, and he asks the chief, what's that doll that you're holding? And he goes, this is my soul. <laughs> and it's just a really funny, it's not a doll, it's my soul. It's just a really funny moment. Okay. Um, yeah, but that chief wasn't exactly wrapped too tight. I mean, <laughs> you know, here it is, this beautiful tropical island. And here's the chief who's also the religious and spiritual leader of his people. He's the shaman as well as the chief. And he's going to marry them by the ceremonies of that tribe. You want to marry her? You want to marry him? Okay, you're married. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, this is your shaman. This is your medicine <laughs> man. And, and that's what he does? Yeah, it, uh, 
it uh, the whole movie's very existentialism. I, I at least I think, and I think that's what the critics have said too that it's an existentialist film, um, and uh, that's the whole thing about the abandonment, everything being uh, meaningless or whatever going on there. But whatever. Um. Anyway, so okay. that's uh, that's about it for Vulcans. Um, I think we kind of wrapped up the reason versus emotion. Well, one other thing: Do you think Spock would agree with our conclusions today? <laughs> he would say they're illogical. Yeah. Well, he would say the fact that it took us an hour and a half of discussing it to figure anything out is just proof of uh, humanity's inability to truly understand what logic is. Well. Um, and of course, I'd say, well, how long did it take Vulcans? We did oh, it in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Bonage. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Too much laughing. Okay. Well, I hope, Brandon, you will come back. Oh, yeah. I'm psyched. Yeah. Uh, I am really, I'm totally psyched that we got somebody else who actually has a philosophy degree. Um, I keep thinking about whether I want to try and pursue that direction or not, and I'm not sure because I'm not sure I want to deal with all of the mess that happens in academia today. Uh, oh, yeah. My goodness. You can get the equivalent of a philosophy degree by reading like 12 books. Really? Well, I've done oh, that. Oh, yeah. I've done That's, that, so well. Uh, the the writing part of it could be hard, though, couldn't it? Well, well, the types of books that after reading one chapter you're falling asleep already. So, well, yeah, yeah, those, yeah, yeah that the, those are. If you want that degree, yeah, you'll have to read those books for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I'm uh, planning on getting a PhD in parapsychology or something else equally esoteric and screwy. Wow, that's. That is esoteric. <laughs> just, just, just so people have to call me doctor. Oh, you're a doctor. You have a PhD. What's your PhD in? Parapsychology, the study of ghosts. LOL. And then yeah. they just give you this <laughs> blank stare. And they're all like, yeah. "Who you gonna call?" I have a PhD in uh, frisbee dynamics and the study of plastic polymer. Uh, Covalent uh, <laughs> recreational devices. Well, there's one way to spend your money and free time. <laughs> yeah, if I had the money or the free time, that's what I would do. Is I'd get a PhD in something like frisbee dynamics or yeah. parapsychology. Another thing that <laughs> concerns me about getting working toward a philosophy degree after I finish my bachelor's in computer science is that um, the metaphysics, the analytical metaphysics stuff. It's just scary. I don't. I don't like it. I don't find much use for it. I'm interested in ethics, and but it sounds like you're going to have to go into all kinds of crap about properties and objects and stuff. And Absolutely I don't. Absolutely, you will. Yeah, you and, should have to. Well, you know, if you're combining a philosophy degree with a computer science degree. You're going to get invited to all of Ray Kurzweil's really cool parties about AI. <laughs> and does a, does a computer have a soul? Can you give a computer a soul? No. You've got a computer science degree and you've got a background in philosophy. I don't know. We're back to the measure of a man again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably return to that one a lot. But like I said, I, I, totally, don't, I, I totally don't think you can. Um, at least if you did, it certainly wouldn't be a computer anymore. It would be something else. It would have a free will machine or something. <laughs> well, why don't we talk about that on a later episode? Because I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, we might want to go with... Well, we've done Measure of a Man already, and if we do Artificial Intelligence, we're going to want to come at it from another angle besides Measure of a Man. Absolutely. Well, you don't have to. I mean, uh, author, there's, there's an episode of Voyager where the doctor's personhood is discussed. In the arguments Why? for his, do that in the that? doctor episode then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to it totally interrupt you, but I kind of did because I, I know <laughs> these guys get. We're we're what going. What was that? Time. Cadet Benjamin. I know we're going past the time. How are you guys on time? 
Um, uh, all I'm saying is you you can analyze this. I mean, the arguments for the doctor's personhood were quite a bit different from the arguments for data's personhood in measure of a man. So there's lots of different ways you can approach this. Oh, yeah, for real, for sure. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us. You can download more episodes of Trekosophy at our website, trekosophy.com. Also, check out our Facebook group. Woo! Live long and prosper and all that good stuff. And uh, then there are the old crusty coffee house philosophy professor types. There are fewer and fewer of those who really like Ayn Rand, but they're out there too. More dumb ideas than you could possibly talk about for an hour. Let's we need see. to get some sponsors so we can have something like Trescosophy was brought to you by Utopia Planitia Shipyards. Whoopi <laughs> Puff <laughs> Before I drink a tall glass of melonade, I like to eat about 147 fluffy puff marshmallows. Brought to you by Sluggo Cola, the slimiest cola <laughs> in the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remember the numbers, but it was there were scary numbers. They had lots of zeros in them. Yeah, let's open the uh, let's open our our document, our magical uh, uh, scroll. Let's unroll it. You know, my, my next generation memory, just to share with you guys, since we have kind of wrapped things up at this point. Yeah. I was looking forward to the rebirth of the series, having watched all the original series through reruns. I'm not quite old enough to have caught them in their original run. And I was excited. I was thrilled. I was going to be there. And I was about 10 minutes late for catching the beginning of the series premiere of Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh. And I figured, well, you know, it's a two-hour premiere. It's okay if I miss a little bit. I turn on the TV, and, and there's the Enterprise, the new futuristic style of Enterprise. And I'm looking at the ship orbiting the planet, and it's got these huge nacelles with the blue stripe down them. It's got the little sleek body. And then it's got this little teeny tiny saucer on top. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> what have they done? <laughs> oh, wow. And then I find out that it's the whole <laughs> disconnected saucer section special. And I'm like, okay, that's I just watched that neat. episode last night. See, I got the Blu-ray set, so I just watched it last night. <laughs> and <it's... laughs> and when you it from the beginning, it's really cool. I mean, the, 